we, I will present now our speaker, who's already with us, Aurore Rugula. She's a reservoir modeling and engineering technical advisor with Emerson. She has over six years' experience in reservoir characterization, modeling, and simulation from a variety of reservoirs around the world. Aurore holds a degree in reservoir hydrodynamic and engineering from the National School of Geology in Nancy. And she will be presenting integrated asset modeling applied to challenging fields for successful reservoir modeling. Aurore, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, can you see correctly my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much. And thank you all for, for joining me uh, in this presentation. So um, to, to today, uh, we will, I will present you uh, a presentation about integrated asset modeling and its application to challenging fields for successful reservoir management. So in this presentation, we will discuss the benefits of integrated asset modeling opposed to um, a siloed approach where reservoir and production network uh, are simulated separately. So the key messages that will be presented uh, in, in, this, uh, in this presentation today are the following. So as you know, uh, maximizing the production and profitab profitability is the ultimate goal for any operator. And that's why uh, all along the field life, strategic and tactical decisions are made. And this decision will greatly impact the recovery and production regularity for the total asset. So, when making this decision, it's really important to understand and uh, yeah, understand the entire production system from subsurface to surface. And then that's why it's important to model um, at this, in one model the subsurface and the surface. And this is what integrated asset modeling is. So we will see together uh, in this presentation that uh, if you follow um, an integrated asset modeling approach, it will allow you to uh, mitigate design and operational risks from reservoir to top side by integrating reservoir and production system models. And it will also uh, give you a tool to uh, support operational decisions and field development strategies to maximize the long-term production and also the benefits of integrated asset modeling are not only uh, economical, there, there are also uh, significant benefits from a technical point of view. So um, indeed, integrated asset modeling, um, for engineers and the flow assurance engineers to collaborate. And uh, this collaboration ensures that there is no loss of information between the disciplines and when transferring data from, from uh, one simulator to another. But also it, also it ensures that the assumption from the different disciplines uh, are consistent. So let's start with uh, a bit of context here. So um, from the extraction from the subsurface to uh, export from production hubs, oil and gas, or more generally speaking, uh, fluids go through a broad range of environments, so uh, reservoirs, surface network, or before that, wells, surface network, and finally processing facilities and to simulate fluid flows through each of these highly specific environments. The reservoir engineers, uh, well engineers, and flow assurance engineers all use um, dedicated tools to their disciplines. So what we often observed is quite a siloed approach where uh, the reservoir engineer will provide production profile to the, uh, the, the, network, the flow assurance uh, engineer. And even though some options exist now 
in reservoir simulator to take into account the surface constraints. So, for example, um, if you use a lift table in your in your simulation, but such a silo, even though there are these options, this silo approach failed to take into account uh, some interaction interaction between the surface and the subsurface. And more specifically, we, we, we observe that this approach fails to take into account, for example, the pressure interaction between the surface and subsurface, but also the impact of changing fluid fraction on, system, on the system back pressure. Or uh, it fails also to really capture the dynamic nature of a field when you have multiple reservoirs that are connected to a common surface network that is sharing a common capacity constraints on production and injection. So what we are looking for is a solution that allow us to uh, take into account all the elements, all this, all the elements of, uh, of the asset when, when we simulate the flow through the different environments. So this is what integrated asset modeling is. So by modeling, uh, the, the uh, subsurface and surface in, in, in one model by integrating subsurface and surface in one model, um, you maximize the value creation from the field as a, as a wall. So, and, and that you, you do it uh, from its development until the end of the field's producing life. So there is really a great value uh, to, to apply integrated asset modeling approach um, to to your field and it really also breaks the the, the bridges or breaks sorry the, the silos by creating bridges <laughs> uh, through uh, uh, between disciplines and this way you really ensure that there is a, a collaboration between the reservoir engineers and flow assurance engineers and you ensure that the assumption made by the different disciplines are consistent but also you make sure that you, you really reduce the risk of data loss uh, between the different um, simulator. So how does it work? So basically in a, in a nutshell, what, uh, what happens when you are running uh, an integrated asset modeling simulation is that the production modeling solution will define whether the bottom hole target is achievable at each time step of the reservoir simulation, accounting for uh, pressure losses in the entire production system. So that's the main idea. And if we uh, have a closer look of what is, uh, how, how does it work, uh, the integrated asset modeling. So here it's the example with um, Emerson's production modeling solution that is uh, called META. So META will simulate uh, integrated network and it will dictate well and group targets for all the flow simulator slaves. So here the flow simulator slaves uh, on this image are um, there are only two slaves. So it's basically the number of, the, of reservoirs that, uh, that are constituting your, your asset. So META um, will send commands between uh, well zones in the reservoir model and inflow zones in the production modeling solution. And as a result, or, or, or before that maybe, so the, so, so the well controls are no longer defined in the reservoir simulator, but by the production modeling solution. So here, META. So META sends the hydrocarbon rates target, for example, or pressure target for the different wells in, um, in the different um, reservoir models that, that exist. And as a result, uh, we obtain production profiles that are reflecting facilities and production system constraints that are um, that are really important inputs to to the to the design and engineering of platforms and facilities. So, just uh, in terms of what kind what simulator can be connected to a meta production modeling uh, solution is uh, so we are we can connect to Eclipse, 
but also to uh, CMG, uh, Tempest More, uh, which is also Emerson Flow Simulator. But basically, we can connect to any Flow Simulator if uh, the vendor can provide the APIs. So when is integrated asset modeling appropriate or applicable? So uh, let's start with at the exploration stage of the field. Um, at this stage, it's quite appropriate to simplify the downhole and surface simulations. So at the exploration stage, maybe integ the, uh, applying integrated asset modeling is not necessary and working with tank models in the production modeling solution is enough at this stage of the field. However, at the development and production stages of the field life, um, there, there are really a strategic and tactical decisions that need to, to be made. And this decision greatly impact the, the rest of, uh, the rest of the projects, so the recovery and the production regularity for the, for the total asset. So it's, that's when uh, the integrated asset modeling will have uh, a lot of benefits. So first during uh, field development, um, design decisions need to, to be made and uh, this decision will put constraints on how the field can be operated in the future, for example. So that's why uh, integrated asset modeling here will be interesting because, uh, because it will allow the engineers to evaluate the most effective development design, taking into account the entire production system. And uh, it will also to, to early uh, identify the, the need for uh, artificial lift and uh, or boosting and take into account these requirements when, when designing the, um, uh, the, the surface facilities. And then during the, the production stage here, uh, integrated asset modeling will be interesting for different purposes. So first for short-term simulations to support operational decisions and adjust to dynamic conditions. That's really key to maximize long-term production. So here the idea is to uh, use integrated asset modeling to uh, adapt um, to, the, to the operational um, condition and uh, make sure to optimally manage the reservoir and well delivery, well delivery and field equipment. And it will also be used for longer term simulation and, and make prediction regarding the field development phases to come. And also it will be useful for, for production allocation. So now let's uh, dive into uh, three different uh, case histories in which uh, integrated asset modeling has been applied to, to challenging fields. So this first case here is a case of uh, integrated asset modeling applied uh, to a subsea oil field development. So this, this field is made of three different reservoirs and Eclipse models were existing for these three uh, reservoirs. So Eclipse, uh, it's a Schlumberger product. Um, so the, the reservoir models were existing and here uh, the, uh, the, the operator had a tight schedule and limited resources to evaluate the optimum development scenarios. So what has been done is that uh, an integrated asset modeling a workflow has been performed uh, using Meta and uh, connecting the, the, the Eclipse models to Meta. And doing so, it's allowed to uh, screen the, the different development scenarios. Gas lift and pressure boosting have been modeled and flow assurance has been carried out. And here, coupling the network and reservoir simulations allowed to really accurately model the back pressure in the system. So what has been then uh, highlighted is that the back pressure in the system was higher when, uh, when modeled, when following an integrated asset modeling approach than, um, than uh, simulating separately the reservoir and network. So 
it shows really the benefits of uh, of integrating the reservoir, the subsurface and the surface to have accurately to to accurately uh, simulate the entire system. And as a result, so it has provided a comprehensive integrated fresh run solution, integrating a production optimization. And uh, it allowed also to, to provide concept dependent uh, profi production profiles that are, uh, here are some examples. And uh, by doing so, it, it gave all the tools uh, to uh, the operator to take informed decision about the optimum development scenario and ensure the technical and economical uh, project viability. Now, uh, the second case is the integrated asset modeling of a large uh, onshore gas field under production. So the field has more than 400 production uh, wells sharing a common production system. And here the, the challenge was to ensure to continue operating the field with minimal equipment while ensuring the pressure balance in the system and make sure that all the wells keep flowing. So integrated asset modeling has been used here and to, to really uh, capture all the direction, in, interactions that exist between the, the more than 400 wells and um, using META, uh, it has been coupled to the, to the reservoir simulator. And what, uh, what, has, what appeared during this study is that uh, the, 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 there is a real need for an increased compression as the field loses reservoir pressure. So to make sure that the, 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 the wellhead pressure do not reach the declination pressure, pressure and, and this uh, to make sure that we're not killing any well. So here it has really uh, allowed to make prediction and identify the timing and the quantification of the, of the future compression needs. Uh, it allowed, it, it ensured also the, the economical project viability. It ensured the fact that uh, the field uh, will be operated in, op in the optimal uh, condition with all the wells uh, flowing. And uh, the last case is the case of, um, of a gas condensate field at the development stage. So this field is made of 13 uh, extremely uh, pressure heterogeneous reservoirs that are connected to a common subsea tieback flow line. So here is a, is a, is a, um, a sketch of, um, of, the, of the surface uh, network. And the, the reservoir simulation um, were existing for the 13 reservoirs. So they have been coupled to, uh, to META, so Emerson's production uh, modeling solution. And integrated production modeling has been performed. Uh, as a result, it has highlighted or it has uh, predicted, predicting, predicted, sorry, the facing of the pressure boosting and power requirements within, within the network to make sure that all the reservoirs are producing in, uh, in the most optimal way. And also the startup and, and phasing of, uh, of the different reservoirs has been predicted. So here we, we, we built basically uh, uh, a production model integrating subsurface and surface, so integrating the 13 reservoirs and the surface uh, facilities to make sure that uh, the planned production strategy was viable. So uh, production profiles have been generated with the contribution from the different reservoirs. And this way the technical and, and economical project viability once again has been, has been confirmed. So these three different uh, case stories highlight uh, different things. The first one is that uh, integrated asset modeling allow a deep understanding of the production system from subsurface to surface, 
what leads to more informed decision making. It, allows, it is really an invaluable tool in development of a field to uh, help engineers identifying pump and compression needs, but also separate the capacities, uh, choking requirements, operational strategies for the field. So at, uh, it is important at the, at the development and production stage of, of the field, and it allows really to mitigate the, the design and operational risk from reservoir to top side. And it makes reservoir engineers and flow assurance engineers collaborate. So you make sure that um, that the consistency is preserved and that uh, there is a consistency also between the different assumptions made by the different discipline. And you reduce the risk of uh, losing uh, data in the process of, uh, of um, providing data to, to, to your colleagues. And performing integrated asset modeling compared to um, simulate separately the reservoir and the network also improves the accuracy of the forecast thanks to a more physically realistic solution. So what also uh, help in uh, in uh, in improving the, the prediction and uh, and leading to so in this presentation I've uh, featured MSN prediction modeling solution which is uh, called Meta. Meta is a part of the MSN ecosystem that is integrating hardware, flow measurements, equipment, and software. So it's uh, all the, um, the portfolio of MSN is very uh, broad. So we have all the tools to ensure successful projects through the entire hydrocarbon chain from subsurface uh, imaging and modeling to production management, uh, like we saw today, um, to uh, flow measurements, virtual flow metering, multi-phase flow metering, and safety and performance control. So we have at Emerson, we have uh, an extensive experience in automation. And sometimes when we uh, discuss uh, about integrated asset modeling, it can also be extended to a uh, process simulator. And that's something that uh, we can also do uh, by, uh, by connecting to, to third party. And, uh, and we are, we have, we have the tools to, um, to go towards the, the, the direction of digital oil field. So um, thank you all for, for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will be, uh, I will be happy to, to answer them. Uh, thank you so much, Aurore. Um, I, I actually have a, a question. So um, what I, from my experience, what I see the, the biggest um, challenge in getting different teams to, to collaborate between, between themselves has to do with the fact that uh, different teams actually have uh, got used to different tools and different uh, vendors. And it, it's sometimes a bit difficult to integrate all the, all the data that is generated by one team because of that fact. Uh, so from what I understand, uh, you are trying to um, to, to go around that by allowing different um, applications from different vendors to interact uh, in your tool. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So uh, what we do when we do integrated asset modeling is that uh, so Emerson uh, software, production modeling software, which is Meta, can connect to um, many different uh, simulators from different vendors. The only requirements is for the vendor to, the vendor of the, of the is to uh, provide APIs of this uh, in the flow simulator so that the two application can, uh, can um, uh, collaborate or connect. So, uh, we we have done projects where we have connected a meter to Tom, to Eclipse, so it works very well uh, to Tempest more because it's our solution. So uh, 
it's of course it connects. Uh, we have also connections to for CMG. Uh, so yes, to, uh, the short answer to your question is yes. We we really try to be as open as we can so that uh, the teams can really collaborate. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Aurore. Um, thank you. We already have the next speaker ready, so we'll have to leave it there. Uh, yeah. Have a nice day. Thank, thank you, you, for, you for coming. and thank you for inviting me. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. So we already have our next speaker. She is Caroline Martinez, a geophysics technical lead with Schlumberger. Um, the competition. <laughs> uh, she is currently part of the business advisory group of uh, Slumberger Information Solutions Headquarters, focusing on geophysical workflows applied in Petrel ENP platform and Delphi. She started her career in Slumberger in 2002, working initially on uh, various commercial projects of seismic processing and imaging. Then she broadened her expertise in geophysics interpretation, seismic inversion and geological modeling by support supporting customers um, in Europe. Her work for the uh, HQ team in Western GECO and SIS developed her expertise in survey design, depth imaging, quantitative interpretation, seismic pore pressure prediction and stratigraphic interpretation in different areas of the globe. Um, so she will be presenting structural, stratigraphic, and quantitative interpretation for enhanced reservoir characterization. You can start. Okay, thank you. So I guess I can. I need to share my screen. Can you see that? Yes, we can see that. Yes. <laughs> Great. Yes, good um, Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, uh, my name is Caroline Martinez. Well, as mentioned, and uh, thank you for the introduction, work for the Business Advisory Group. And today, I will be presenting the structural, stratigraphic, and quantitative interpretation done on a data set from Australia, and the value of it in the reservoir characterization of, uh, of this field. Um, the data set used is from Geoscience Australia. It's located in the North Carnarvon Basin and more exactly uh, in the Exmouth Basin in this area. This uh, basin is Australia's premier hydrocarbon province where the majority of deep water well has been drilled. So the major basin fault trend, um, it's north or northwest, northeast, and define a series of structural high and sub basin. And uh, this is um, basically the two lines showing these two cross sections here. Almost all the hydrocarbon resources are reservoired within the upper Triassic. So that will be this green layer here. And on this section, this green layer here. So upper Triassic, Jurassic, and lower Cretaceous sandstone beneath the regional early Cretaceous seal. So we have a seal and we have sand unit here. So basically, I will be um, presenting you some technical work that we've done. Um, and this covers structural stratigraphic interpretation to first understand and build the structural framework. And then looked into quantitative work as a facious uh, in 3D environment and the fluid um, uh, distribution, if any. So let's start with the structural interpretation. At first, we look at the data. So the data, uh, this is basically just a, a picture showing the data. The well, we have the top Macedon sandstone here, uh, part of this lower barrel group. So basically, the sand unit is around here, mudstone around here. Um, the signal to noise ratio is pretty good. Um, we clearly see the structure. And just a comment on the polarity of the wavelet. So the polarity of the wavelet is negative, meaning an increase in acoustic impedance will appear in black, as we can see in the water bottom while um, a decrease will appear in white. And that will be basically the structure we need to interpret and look at. The amplitude spectrum here show here 
data in the target area. So here it's approximately min minus 20 dB, mi minus 14 or 12 is around here. We have um, a wide spectrum between 8 to 10 Hertz up to, I would say, 90 Hertz. So that was just for the for the looking at the data and the zoom at the data here. Before starting any interpretation, we had a look into the time depth relationship and the log. So here on the left, you can see one of the three um, wells that we use with gamma ray track resistivity, with the shallow resistivity and high resistivity, and we see the anomaly here between um, the near and the far, density neutron track, the PEF, the sonic, um, the red one being the compressional density, the saturation interpreted um, by the petrophysicist, and some initial fascia, fascia interpretation. This is showing the well tie of one of the wells, the same well actually, uh, with the reflectivity series, a decrease here in acoustic impedance popping up in reddish positive color here. So a good, a good um, match to start. The horizon has been, main horizon has been interpreted and I will not focus on that. It's, it's a trivial. Um, I will focus on the structural interpretation. So we have used the classical attributes, seismic attribute to kind of highlight the discontinuity. Here you see a classical variance attribute rendered on the seismic. And why I'm mentioning that is because it has been used as an input for the end tracking uh, workflow that highlights nicely the structure and the continuity for this data set. So this was kind of the initial stage where we, we wanted to under identify the fold and, um, and the trend uh, for the Macedon interval, so the Macedon sandstone, it's a unit we are looking um, into, and here we are uh, looking at that. So at this stage, fold could be interpreted manually or uh, with the end tracking by tuning the parameter, potentially extract um, in 3D the fold, but we wanted to give a try uh, to, uh, to use the machine, the new um, technology, machine learning approach, and to test it on this data set. So the approach that we choose uh, is uh, the user train uh, methodology. So basically there is a machine learning brain and um, it has been trained by all input uh, and all input it's what we call uh, the label. And so what is the label? So basically it's some interpretation done on inline cross line for the entire section where we actually uh, look at the fold. So approximately 2% of the fold, of the cube has been uh, labeled. And within this work, uh, it's a bit like 80% is the validation label, um, the training label, sorry, and 20% in uh, blue, it will be the validation label. So the training label, this is what the brain will use to, to, to train itself while the validation label are not used in the training process. They are just used to validate the brain and the model in the brain. Um, to do that, um, we look at uh, one seismic section. Here is an example. And here I'm just showing you a render of the end tracking result that sometimes helps uh, when it's not so visible uh, to understand where are the folds. So then uh, we can pick it. The labeling is an important step. It's, um, it's a bit uh, critical. Um, the fold needs to be accurately labeled to not mislead the brain. Um, and it's also um, important that they are visible on the seismic. The input to the, this approach is the seismic itself, not an attribute. So it has to be visible in the brain, at least for the training of the brain. Yeah. So once it, this step is done, um, we've run several tests and uh, I will be focusing uh, of the best result. So this is just a seismic with the end tracking rendered on it. And um, basically the, the, what the machine uh, learning approach gave us. So voilà, there, there is a, the end tracking give a very good um, trending and information and helps the interpreter. However, to, today there is a technology uh, and that's good to hear that has been improved. And what we see here, this result, in fact, this yellow line that you see, it's uh, the fault um, prediction or probability 
um, basically uh, of uh, of the calculation and it's rendered on the seismic alors this is um, a nice view on a time slice but let's have a look how it looks in 3D. So this is, while the end tracking was giving us some very nice indication of the fault presence on the seismic, um, when it comes to extract, bah, voilà, we have a bit less continuity, a bit more noise, uh, it's, uh, it's picking up many things, while the, the brain um, is it's smarter in a way and identified really the, the fault plane, and we came up with the less noise and a better continuity uh, for this. So this um, probability cube um, is not the end of it. Based on that, uh, we need to QC it and to create some attributes uh, on that. And I'm showing you just a time slice of two of these attributes that are created, um, being the planarity, the planarity of the fault here, and then the azimuth. So why they are important? Because well, as we can see there is a kind of a color scale here. And when the fault connect, um, we have a lower value. And basically, this is the value that will be used as a threshold to, um, to basically split the fault. So that's an important QC, and we need to understand that. While the azimuth can be used if you want to isolate azimuth sector, in our case, we didn't use that. We have extracted uh, all the azimuth, but we use uh, the planarity uh, attribute. So it's... Um, provide the threshold, few parameters, and then the output from the probability cube is in the form of a point set, if you like, and this point set can be QC um, and merge and split, um, and this is an important step. Uh, machine learning is a, is a smart tool, but it's not as smart as the interpreter, so there is some work um, to be done here. And then these objects are basically used as an input when uh, we create structural framework and um, all the faults uh, identified and um, and this is a structural framework that was quickly built um, after uh, this stage to understand the structure. So once the structural interpretation is done um, and the framework, framework is built, um, we had to look at the, um, basically the stratigraphic. So the depositional environment is still elastic with delta H approach for this um, sandstone unit, for the barrow group. And uh, we, we, we wanted to investigate, or in fact not to investigate because we knew some channel were there, but to delineate them um, in, the, in the best way. And um, basically this is showing you uh, the horizon based on the interpretation of the top Macedon sandstone. So we can see that it's uh, highly faulted. There are some high, some low, and it's very complex. So this is a time slice here uh, where we start to pick up a channel. However, we lost this channel due to the structure. So flattening was used. So the seismic volume has been just flattened. Uh, on this uh, horizon uh, to have the, the, the channel appearing everywhere. In fact, it was a bit of a surprise because even on a time slice, we could not pick up clearly uh, this part of the channel due to the, to the tectonic. Uh, basically, it was, it was not clear that it was a channel. It was uh, lost in the middle of other information. So once this uh, volume has been um, flattened, we use classical also attribute to investigate, so the classical RMS huh, that gave uh, in uh, almost all the cases a very good, uh, very good information. But we also use the sweetness, which is in fact the combination of two attributes, the envelope and the instantaneous frequency, and that's used to identify features where the overall energy uh, signature change within the seismic data. And we can clearly see our channel here on the sweetness. And then we also had a look at the relative acoustic impedance. So that's basically the integration of the seismic trace. And that uh, can be useful to indicate uh, sequence boundary and conformities and so on, and, uh, and uh, changes in the, in the facies as well. To extract accurately, in fact, we wanted to push the cursor further um, than to you. So we gave a try to the generalized spectral decomposition on the top Macedon sandstone flatten. So basically, this methodology 
is an hybrid method of uh, general spectral decomposition. Um, it's a compromise, if you like, um, between the temporal resolution and the frequency discrimination uh, that are um, basically the, 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 the weakness of, uh, the, uh, of some specific method uh, being uh, the, the short-term Fourier transform or the continuous wavelet transform. So basically, this approach tries to balance uh, the strength and weakness of these two techniques um, to have a, a better uh, frequency resolution as well as vertical. So here we are at the top Macedon sandstone, and uh, in, uh, in yellow is just a rendering of, of the fault uh, and discontinuity of the untracking. Um, and um, this is what we see for the top unit, and I will be just moving down. And why I'm stopping here? Because it was a bit surprising, but and it's not, in fact, stratigraphic, but we had this low frequency um, anomalies uh, on the side of the structure where there is a main fault around here. And you see like sharp discontinuities between the two. Later on, we will see what it could be. Um, but uh, yeah, we had this anomaly that is, uh, was popping up. The channel Sorry to interrupt, Carol. Uh, yes? We'll ask you just to hold on because we, we kind of lost a connection to the streaming room and we try to solve it. And I want to make sure that no one misses all the beautiful pictures you are showing. So, okay. Carol, we'll work. Just, please, just a couple of minutes, please. And in the meantime, I remember all the, the attendees that they can do their question during the presentation. It doesn't need to, to wait for the end. And uh, they have a button on the right side with a question mark icon. And you can take this small break to, to have a coffee or something you need. See you in a couple of minutes. Okay, you can go on. Thank you for waiting. Sorry. Okay, so I hope it was not um, uh, a big issue. So yes, uh, I will uh, just resume where uh, where I was. Um, so the top um, Macedon sandstone with general spectral decomp, and going down, seeing this low frequency anomaly, and the channel start to to pop up, and then for this um, slice here. Um, a lot better. So why we want for this attribute? Because it's enable like uh, we have a better uh, continuity, a better uh, illumination, if you like, uh, visualization of, of the channel. So then we could extract um, the, the channel, the body of the channel, and estimate the size, and uh, and then um, incorporate uh, this in the model at a later test stage. Okay, I've been built the structural framework and identify the stratigraphic elements, uh, this uh, big channel that was uh, spotted uh, just um, below the, in the, within the target area, just below the top of a structural high. We will now look into the elastic information from the seismic data. So, so far we worked um, on um, um, full uh, stack data. So we had some uh, angle stacks, so then we could um, investigate uh, AVO reconnaissance workflow and, um, and seismic inversion. 
So these four angle stack were available. Those angle stack after QC indicate the need of preconditioning in you know, to align all the angle stack at the target level um, as the, the, the AVO anomaly needs to be extracted um, at the same time, if you like. So the methodology chosen is called seismic trace alignment. It computes a trace by trace, sample by sample uh, time shift. The time shift um, value, you can see that render on the seismic, the green-ish and the blackish. Uh, value is like around minus plus minus six milliseconds for the the more saturated color. And uh, this time shift time shift cube is then computed for each uh, angle stack and applied. And um, and then I'm just uh, showing you some effect on the far stack and the ultra far because this is where it was the most uh, visible. So this is where our target area here, our horizon, that is important to us. And yeah, I'm just showing. So of course, uh, we check on the correlation before after uh, to make sure that, uh, that we are not basically uh, applying some wrong uh, thing to the seismic data. And uh, we observed um, uh, a better. So basically, the, the map below is the after one for this um, uh, reservoir interval. And uh, there is uh, an improvement. After having done that, we had a look at the amplitude spectrum for this uh, near, mid, far, and ultra far. So this one is ultra far, a bit more uh, uh, lower frequency, but a bit, uh, well, um, and this is the signal to noise. So this is the, the, the uh, basically the signal to noise estimation. So the value of the noise here is around four and ten. And it was important to us to understand if there are some variation between the angle stack in regards to noise, because it's an important element uh, for the inversion uh, to be taken in account. And here in this display here, just showing some um, angle uh, gather uh, after the preconditioning that had the effect to flatten. Um, all the, the the angle basically along the horizon. So after this conditioning, we computed classically for the ABO reconnaissance. We didn't know if it was any ABO effect in the data, so we had to investigate that. So we computed intercept and gradient attribute. So the intercept on this picture is showed in black and white, while the gradient is in color and is rendered on the top. So we kind of, okay, in this area where we had some anomalies, um, it's kind of showing some AVO effect, and this is uh, also showing you the product of the normal incidence and patient ratio contrast um, that can head uh, in general to, to identify AVO anomaly, but uh, potentially uh, fluid um, presence. Or... So we had an anomaly. Having confirm that, and then we say, okay, we go for uh, for uh, basically seismic elastic inversion and using those angle stack, and try to be brief, but uh, one of the key uh, elements was uh, was the wavelet. The wavelet uh, need to capture the essence of the signal without carrying too much noise. We had three wells, four angle stack. So well, it was a bit of a, of a tricky step. First, in fact, we, what we did is for each angle stack, we extracted the deterministically uh, the wavelet, so basically from, at the well location from the reflectivity series and the seismic. And uh, for each angle stack, then we tested um, averaging. We tested simultaneous extraction of the three well for the interval. Um, we were still not um, convinced, so we tested um, to extract a statistical wavelet that will carry less noise. And in fact, we have ad adapted, modified um, the, this wavelet with the time shift observed and remaining um, even after the um, time TDR, the time depth relationship and the synthetic. We had, I think, three milliseconds still time shift left and a bit of rotation. So that was then uh, modified and we managed to have um, basically a wavelet like following the, the signal but without carrying too much noise. We also tested several inversion tests um, when it was uh, when we were at that stage to see uh, how much of the signal was invert and inverted and how much was left. So basically that was uh, that was uh, the, the strategy here around the wavelet. Then another step is to build the low frequency model so the that was uh, voilà, not a, a very complex uh, step. Huh? We use the well we had, we just extrapolate along the horizon we had, and we have filters on down to 10 Hertz. Um, that was basically for its 
signal to noise uh, ratio parental wear enter, and this here you are looking at the acoustic impedance low frequency model, and that was basically the inversion result. So capturing a lot of, uh, of nice feature and basically showing some low frequency anomalies uh, with a nice fold here and uh, the structure popping up. For VPVS, the same. So that was the result, low frequency inverted. We can see that. So we use three well. So this orange, green, and blue well. And here, and for each track, we have acoustic impedance, VPVS, and density. Um, you see here in the middle the logs. And on the side, the inverted result, the idea being you want to basically check that your inversion is capturing the features that you see. So we were quite pleased uh, with the result. Um, it was quite reasonable. Sometimes it's really in the, uh, you can see the structure here going down. So it was kind of uh, challenging, but we were very happy and pleased with, uh, with those results that show a, a good QC plot. So after the, this step, hein, the heavy reconnaissance and then the inversion, uh, but we need basically to bridge the gap hein, uh, um, with, uh, with the fastest um, classification, fluid identification. So basically, we need to bridge the, the gap between what is observed at the, at the well location and uh, to, to, to estimate in 3D uh, based on this output of, uh, of uh, the inversion. So here, what you see is uh, one cross plot. We, in fact, we were looking for the fastest classification. It was a bit challenging, I have to say. So here you see a cross plot with acoustic impedance here uh, and the VPVS here. And this is for um, a broader interval. So it's like um, the, barrow, the entire barrow group that includes as well some moonstone and a bit of uh, marl in the, in the shallower part. Um, and then we filter that down uh, to look only into the sand interval, uh, the, the Macedon interval. And this is what we came up with. The color that you see here, that was the interpreted facies. The red part being the part where we have sand. We saw that in the log and we also had some resistivity uh, um, anomalies uh, and uh, indicating the, the presence of hydrocarbon and, um, and the water saturation interpreted from, from those logs. So having done that at the well, then we perform some little analysis and you can see the Bayesian probability function in 3D, acoustic impedance here, probability on this axis and VPVS. So it wasn't very very easy to separate between the two, huh? and we have a bit of uncertainty uh, at the boundary. It's not a clear group. However, this is clearly uh, the, the signature of um, at least the gas uh, could, uh, could uh, lead to this behavior really um, uh, digging or coming to, to the lower value. So uh, the little facies prediction was then conduct and applied to this inverted acoustic impedance and VPVS volume. So the, it provided us uh, this facious uh, classification. So here we are looking at the facies of the uh, basically hydrocarbon bearing sand unit. And we recognize the kind of structure here. Um, and this is the associated uh, probability volume with value of 100% here in the red color uh, of presence of these facies um, and, and at uh, its location. So that was a very good to understand what the extent of it, uh, why it stopped in some, in some area, where it continue, um, well, to, to delineate the structure, potentially understand better the contact. So that was um, a very um, good information to, to capture here. The next step, Rolin, you have um, five minutes. Yes, I'm done. I'm nearly done. So after the, the facies, uh, we basically wanted to estimate uh, the porosity volume from the acoustic impedance. Um, this is, again, a cross plot of acoustic impedance porosity. Um, for the entire um, barrel group, filtered only at the sand level. We have just applied this relationship to the acoustic impedance and use this seismic um, porosity, or I call it, as a second trend uh, for the modeling. So basically, we, we use Kriging, uh, use the log as a hard data, and use basically uh, this computed volume uh, to help in populate the properties. And we can see the highest value of this effective porosity uh, popping up at the same area of uh, the facies. 
um, of uh, hydrocarbon bearing sand. So that was it, but we were a bit surprised that uh, basically it's, uh, it seems that all the, the interesting area is really at the top of the structure with uh, with the mudstone acting as a seal and um, and um, we didn't see uh, deeper down so the channel is just right below this area and here we are looking just at a K, K layer so basically of, of the model and going down and going down and uh, and when we reach the channel level we can see some traces and of found some places where hydrocarbon is present so um, but it's also uh, truncated by many fault and uh, I guess um, the mudstone were missing to, to seal the, the trap. So some hydrocarbons are not uh, fully uh, present um, anymore um, in, in this channel, in this structure right uh, below. Voilà, so this was basically what was done. Uh, we, we've done some structural interpretation. We use um, the, the technology, the new technology that many people talk about, the machine learning fault interpretation, and uh, that help us to, to gain some time, actually, uh, to do the, the fault interpretation. Seismic attribute, um, flattening, um, and to interpret clearly the stratigraphic feature and extract them. Quantitative interpretation and lithosphere specification help really to, to have an idea in 3D about what's going on at the well level. And, uh, and this kind of entire geophysical workflow um, also um, enabled with real collaboration between geophysics domain experts because it is kind of true that uh, inversion experts were not the stratigraphic expert and so on. So we kind of collaborate all together. So that was uh, very nice. And but also with the geology team um, and the modeling team. Um, since uh, this, all this geophysics output play a critical role um, by, to create basically the model um, to, um, um, to the geological and modeling result uh, and integrate kind of fully all this GNG workflow and, uh, and, uh, and that was uh, really, um, really, really nice to, to have this opportunity to work with, uh, with this data on this field. So thank you very much for uh, for your attention, and um, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, I have uh, myself uh, a couple of questions. Um, when you uh, when you were, you were checking the the inversion results uh, with the wells to see if the inversion was reproducing um, the the features in the wells. Were any of those wells blind well tests? No. So the three wells that has been used here uh, was uh, the wells that were actually used in the in the wavelet extraction or taken in account. Mm -hmm. um, we had one um, blind well that we used because we had a short um, recording of the log, so it could not be used for for extraction, and uh, we had some similar um, and. Uh, some similar result um, with, a, with a good match. Um, actually, on the three wells that I showed you, there is one well that, after all, maybe was not taken in account too much because we had to work so much on the wavelet that um, I think the one well, the last one, could be uh, was a bit outside the area um, around okay. this zone here, and uh, that was yeah. So that was uh, the last uh, the last well could be considered as a. As a, as a blind uh, well, if you like. And and the only the other question I have is one that affects me personally is, have you um, succeeded in using the workflow for carbonate? Ah oui, for carbonate, it's uh, voilà, there are some challenges. Um, so for carbonate, uh, alors, um, we had in the past, um, but not with this algorithm, uh, not with uh, with uh, this inversion, with uh, with an inversion um, that uh, can handle better the highest contrast, and um, yeah. So that was uh, done using this methodology when, uh, of course, uh, the seismic resolution can catch. Um, sometimes uh, with carbonate, uh, voilà. sometimes we have uh, some some uh, thickness and resolution challenge as well. Yes, I'm aware of that. <laughs> uh, so, okay, yeah. Caroline, 
Thank you very much uh, for being a part of this. Um, we have to leave it here because we already have our next speaker ready. Thank you so much uh, for having some time with us. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. So um, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is already uh, waiting for us. Um, he's Conor O'Sullivan, a final year PhD researcher at the Irish Centre for Research in Applied Geoscience, based at University College Dublin, and is investigating the structural evolution of the Slyne and Aries basins off the northwestern coast of Ireland, an important area of the Irish offshore for gas exploration and potential future storage of captured CO2. Uh, he has worked with several operators in the area to refine their structural models and improve their understanding of the role of large crustal scale structures and the role of salt in basin evolution. Connor is currently the president of the Ireland branch of the Petroleum Exploration Society of Great Britain and holds a master's in petroleum geoscience and a BSc in geology from the Imperial College of London. Uh, he will be presenting a multi-layered salt systems on the Irish Atlantic margin, their role in basin development, natural glass inspiration, and CO2 storage. Welcome, Connor. Thank you very much, Sarah. I will share my screen now. So you can see that okay? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for the introduction. I know it was a bit long. Um, so just before we begin, um, I'd like to look at the uh, the rationale behind the research that we do and why we do it. Um, so salt tectonics at present is very poorly understood um, offshore Ireland. Uh, the distribution and composition of salt layers is not very well known, but we do know that it plays a key role in existing hydrocarbon discoveries um, on the Irish Atlantic margin. Uh, additionally, if we look at a ga uh, the graph on the right, it shows electricity generation in Ireland by fuel type uh, from last year. And what we see is that the little green triangles that represent natural gas, you can see that natural gas still makes up a very large portion of Ireland's energy mix, um, especially during the summer months when the installed wind capacity uh, doesn't meet the, the demand. Um, and so some of the, the impacts and societal impacts of what we do is in the near term energy security for the island of Ireland, um, but then touching on uh, climate action. So towards the end of the talk, I look at the role of natural gas uh, structures as potential storage sites for CO2. And so there's an element of climate action in there as well. And you can see the UN sustainability goals that we touch on down in the bottom left there. Um, so a brief introduction to the Irish Atlantic margin for those who are not familiar with it. Um, on the left, you can see what's colloquially known as the real map of Ireland. So like Portugal, Ireland is an Atlantic facing uh, nation and the offshore area of Ireland is actually 10 times the size of onshore Ireland. So we're very much uh, a maritime sort of uh, watery country. Um, beneath the seabed offshore, you can see with the map on the right, um, the seabed is made up of uh, a framework of, of rift basins that extends from the western coast of Ireland across uh, the Irish margin to the Atlantic Abyssal Plain in the far west past the Edoras Bank. And what these rift basins represent essentially is a series of failed rifts that predated the opening of the Atlantic and they get younger so they essentially fail and step westwards um, as you go westwards towards the eventual oceanic crusts beneath the Atlantic. Um, and an additional bit of background for everyone is just about the energy landscape and what the industry looks like in Ireland. So in 2015, the Irish government had a very successful offshore licensing round and uh, areas, particularly the Porcupine Basin. Um, let me turn on my little laser pointer. The Porcupine Basin here, the Goban Spur to the south, and the margin, the uh, margins of the Rockall Basin were uh, particularly popular spots for companies to get uh, licensed acreage. Now, in more recent times, the uh, Irish government has brought in a ban on the issuing of future oil licenses um, and potentially gas licenses with the new government. Um, so existing licenses are, are safe, but there won't be any new licenses issued essentially, at least for oil exploration. Um, and this political uncertainty coupled with a few uh, high profile dry wells, so crucially the Druid and Drum Beg, 
uh, poll which tested um, the Cretaceous and Cenozoic uh, turbulent systems, and then Iller's uh, Cenox Iller well, which tested Jurassic fault blocks. This poor uh, drilling success, coupled with political uncertainty, meant that a lot of the majors have left the high risk areas of offshore Ireland. So, what you can see between the two maps on the left and the right, which are licensed maps from March of last year and March of this year, is the companies are now focusing on the more well understood um, eastern flank of the Porcupine Basin down here. Um, and areas around existing infrastructure. So Ireland's two producing gas fields at present are the Kinsale gas field off the southern coast of Ireland that was discovered in the 70s and is now uh, undergoing decommissioning. Um, and then the Carb gas field here within our study area off the western coast of Ireland. So you can see there's a lot of licenses around those that infrastructure and that's where companies are focused on lower risk uh, near infrastructure exploration. So the study area that I'm going to talk about today is the is the Slan and Eris Basin. So they're essentially an interconnected chain um, of half grabbins and grabbins um, with sort of a, a quite a long, complex and multi-phase uh, evolution. Uh, we get the first phase of rifting in the late Permian, uh, which is following the um, the end of the Verisk and Orogeny, so a very early orogenic collapse. We then get a second phase of rifting in the early Jurassic. And then the final phase of rifting occurs in the late Jurassic, which is the main phase of rifting, and we get the deposition of several kilometers of, of uh, fluvio-estrine uh, sandstones and mudstones. Now, with the end of rifting at the end of the Jurassic, the area experiences kilometer scale uplift and erosion in the Cretaceous. This is due to the development of the neighboring Rockwall Basin, which is a very large hyperextended basin. Um, and then in the Cenozoic, from a variety of factors, including the uh, initiation of uh, North Atlantic Ridge push as the, you begin to form oceanic crust, in the Mid-Atlantic, in addition to the development of the North Atlantic Igneous Province. Now associated with that North Atlantic Igneous Province, we get the extrusion of a lot of lavas. So this is the Drew Formation here, this early to mid Eocene lavas, which occur locally in the area, as well as a variety of sills that intrude throughout the stratigraphy in the area. Now, my talk today is about multi-layered salt systems, um, and these are the two layers that we're going to focus on, the first of which is the upper Triassic Ilan Halite member, which is a member of the current formation. And that's a lateral equivalent to things like the Kuiper um, of Northwestern Europe or the Mercy Mudstone of the UK. Um, and the second layer is the upper Permian Zechstein group. This is a, a very well known salt giant present all across Northwestern Europe. Um, and what I'll show you today is that it actually extends as far westwards as the Irish Atlantic margin. Now, in addition to this, we have two other layers of salt that we find locally. The first is um, a Mississippian, so lower Carboniferous uh, age salt that occurs quite locally. And then we also get this, these little layers of salts in the uh, lower Jurassic Mela formations. They're a tangent age and they're probably forming at the same time as the de Gorda formations that you would find in, in Portugal. So how do we actually map the salt offshore Ireland? Well, we rely on uh, two principal data sets, the first of which is well data. Now, the Irish Atlantic margin is a pretty underexplored area, um, and we have 10 exploration wells plus a few appraisal and production wells to draw on, and we're essentially looking at one exploration well per 1,000 kilometers, so it's a pretty sparse well database. Um, so to supplement this, we rely on seismic data, and you can see we have a much more comprehensive seismic data set now. This is a multi-vintage data set stretching from the 90s, uh, sorry, the early 70s, uh, to more recent seismic surveys, the ones in the 70s are, as you'd expect, very bad quality, whereas the ones acquired particularly in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then more recently in 2010 and 2013 are of better quality. Now, the seismic data in this area suffers a lot from the near surface geology. As I mentioned, we have the North Atlantic Indian Province, so we get these lavas and the associated sills that feed them, um, which are present locally throughout the basin. And then we also get this Cretaceous uh, limestone quite close to the surface, which is a very hard crystalline limestone. So when the seismic energy leaves the base of that formation, you get a lot of multiples and a lot of loss of seismic image quality. But essentially with the seismic data, what we're looking for is characteristic salt-related structures. So things like salt diapirs, salt pillows, uh, lister faulting, um, and salt rollers, uh, but primarily mechanical detachment of the supra and subsalt sections. Uh, which is different from what you get in a salt core um, rift basin where you have basin involved salting. So I'll walk you through the well database quickly. Um, for the upper Permian Zechstein group, we have five wells. This is a, a well correlation going from uh, south to north, from left to right. 
and you can see down in the south of the study area we have um, a very thick, over 200 meters um, of very clean halides. You can see from the core photos, it's a very clean, white, sort of tasamony pink um, crystalline halide. But as we go northwards in the study area, the salt content in the Permian decreases. And when we get up to the aerospace in the north, we're looking at meter scale to submeter scale and hydride stringers in a section that is predominantly made up of carbonates and plastics. So we're losing our salt in, in this interval as we go northwards. Now looking at the second layer of salt, this upper Triassic layer, you can see here in pink, this is the ill and halite member that's formed locally in sort of the northern slime, the center of the study area, northern slime and the southern Aris area. Here it's uh, in, in this particular well here, the 1820-3 well, you can see that this well drills through the crest of a dire pyramid of over 600 meters of halite there. Now it's different from the Permian halite because you have all these interfetted uh, little stringers of red mudstone. So those are could either be actually interfetted layers of mudstone or they could be bits of uh, country rock from the local uh, sort of mudstone member of this formation that have been carried up in the during the halokinesis in this diaper. Um, and then away from the area where we have the salt developed, the halide developed, we have uh, meter to submeter scale again, stringers of anhydrite in this section. So with the well database in mind, I'll quickly show you a few um, salt related structures uh, of interest in the study area. So down in the very south of the basin here, we have a, a pretty characteristic reactive diop here, nothing too crazy. You can see the classic divergence of uh, reflectors between the carboniferous and the overlying Mesozoic section. And interestingly here, we get erosion of the lower Jurassic at the base of the upper Jurassic. Um, so that gives us a good indication of timing of halokinesis. So we're seeing the salt movement pretty early on in that second phase of rifting, that early Jurassic phase of rifting. But then this uh, reactive diop here then gets reactivated during the upper Jurassic phase of rifting and we get continued movement on this fault. If we move a bit further north, we get quite an interesting uh, structural configuration here in the central slime base, and you can see there's this complicated um, structure right up against the uh, one of the basin banding faults, um, and it's a very high relief structure. So at the well location 2741, the lower Jurassic here is essentially at the same elevation as it is in the 2751 well. Even though these locations are very different, you have the 2741 well in the highest drain part of the basin, immediately adjacent to the basin banding fault, while the 2751 well is on the low strain basin margin. So something, there's a bit of active salt tectonics going on here. We also again see indicators of timing of halokinesis. You get the upper Jurassic section uh, growing growth sequences away from the crest of that structure into the hanging wall of this big detachment here, this big district fault. And crucially, you can see the 2741 well when it drills into, into the lower Jurassic. Here it actually finds oil. So these are viable uh, oil bearing structures uh, that are formed partially through salt uh, offshore Ireland. Now both of those structures um, occurred in areas of the basin where we only had one layer of salt. When we get up to sort of the northern slide and southern Aris areas, we actually get two layers of salt developed. And so we get quite interesting structures forming here. You can see these three uh, salt pillows here. We have sort of long, long wavelength, low amplitude salt pillows in the Permian section, a relatively simple folded lower Triassic section, and then a complicated faulted overburden in the Jurassic and the post drift sequence above the second layer of salt in the upper Triassic. So quite cool structures going on. And this was uh, informally called double decker salt tectonics by a paper in 2005. Now, let's zoom in on this middle structure here, because this is the carved gas field that I mentioned at the start of the talk. Um, and we're going to look at that in a bit more detail. This is located here, um, immediately off the western coast of Ireland. So the carved gas field is a 1.1 or 1 .1 TCF um, gas field, and it's developed by a subsea tieback to an onshore gas terminal. So there's a, a subsea manifold on the seabed here, and it's an 80 kilometer uh, tieback to an onshore processing plant. Um, and at peak demand, the field provides 60% of Ireland's gas demand. So it's, it's a very important part of our, uh, Ireland's energy independence. Um, and crucially, the field is expected to shut down in 2035. Now, the petroleum system here is pretty simple. We have our gas being sourced from our underlying carboniferous uh, coal horizons here in black. And then this charge is the uh, lower Triassic uh, carb sandstone formation, which is this simply folded uh, dark purple layer here. And then this is capped by that second layer of salt, that uh, upper Triassic uh, LN halite member. 
So you can see from the picture on the right there, there's actually a few different structural levels here. And there's a bit of a comp there's a bit of complication going on in, in what's happening. So I'm going to walk you through the different structural elements of the field and show you why bits of it work and why some bits of it actually don't work. So we're going to start down at the bottom. This is the uh, lower Triassic reservoir section. Um, and this lower Triassic sandstone is essentially isopacus. It's about 300 meters pretty much everywhere in the basin. So this top lower Triassic map also represents a top salt map. And what you can see is that you have this relatively simple four-way dip close uh, structure uh, folded by a relatively simple sort of elongated salt cord fold, or salt fold, sorry, it's a salt cord fold. Um, and we also see adjacent smaller structures. This is the Car of North uh, satellite discovery, um, which is also another smaller uh, salt cord fold adjacent to the, to the main structure. Now, as we go up to the, um, the overlying seal, the upper Triassic salt seal, we can see the structure is broadly the same. We see the same fold, and we see it flanked by the same elongated synclines. But crucially, along the crest of this structure, we see a thickening. We see a little sort of salt wall or salt diaper formed at the crest of the structure. Now, what's interesting to see here is that the trend of this diaper is essentially parallel to the trend of the underlying salt court fold, the fold axis of that fold. So we're already getting an indication that these two distinct layers of salts are communicating in strain and that the structural evolution is linked between these two. Um, the diaper isn't actually parallel to the, the, the fold axis of the fold. It's slightly offset because it's sort of a reactive diaper, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, overlying this uh, upper Jurassic salt is, is our Jurassic section. And here what we have is this relatively large tilted fault block bounded by a fault uh, running along its sort of south, uh, southeastern margin. Um, and then in the hanging wall of this, we have this sort of complicated faulted rollover. And what happens here is as the Permian salt pillow grows in relief, you get instability above that in the Jurassic section. And then the failure of that is facilitated by a delamination fold. And so you're essentially shedding the thick uh, Jurassic section down into the flanking synclines um, and reducing the essentially the, the kinetic energy at the top of the structure. Now, this tilted fault block was actually the initial target of the 1821 uh, discovery well back in 96. But when they drilled through the upper Jurassic and the lower Jurassic section, what they found was a series of breached oil columns. So there was there was a very large oil trap at one stage, but when they drilled through, they found a lot of residual oil columns. So why is that happening? Well, let's have a little look at the poster section. So what we can see here is that we see a, a very distinct fault here, offsetting the base Cretaceous in conformity which is essentially our base uh, poster sequence uh, horizon. And you can see it's that same fault that's being reactivated, and it's offsetting both the Cretaceous section and these Eocene lavas, which have been dated to 40 million years old in one of the wells at Carb. So this fault is actually reactivated quite recently. Um, and crucially, it's reactivated after our main phase of charge, which comes at the end of the Jurassic. So what's actually going on here? Well. When you have this reactivated fault, you can see the growth sequences here in the Cretaceous and then the offset of the lavas in purple. As the fault is moving post-charge, you're getting a combination of cross-fault juxtaposition of your sandstones. Um, so this, especially the upper Jurassic, is a very nice uh, series of stacked flevio estuarine sandstones. And when you get that cross-fault juxtaposition, you get communication between your sandstone bodies. And so you lose your oil charge out of, out of your main uh, tilted fault block trap. Um, and then in addition to this, when you get movement on the fault plane, you're going to get dilation of the fault plane. So there's two mechanisms, two vehicles by which you can lose uh, your oil charge. But so why do we have um, breached oil columns that are preserved gas charge? Well, if we look at the fault plane, we can crucially see that it's because we have this second layer of Triassic salt. This is soling out on that second layer of salt. And so when it's reactivated in the post rift, it's not actually interacting with the lower Triassic, uh, the very simple uh, salt core fold. So as you lose your oil charge up here, anything that's preserved beneath this salt is going to be uh, it's going to be very happy and not going to be uh, lost to that post drift uh, tectonic activity. So we can see that carb is a very good um, natural gas trap, but a lot of these features that make it a very good um, trap for natural gas also mean that it's a very good trap for a very good storage site for CO2 in the future. Some of the benefits of this are that we We've drilled a lot of wells into it. It's a well understood structure, but we haven't drilled too many wells to make it like Swiss to make it like Swiss cheese, which is bad for CO2 storage. 
We know it's a good quality reservoir for storing uh, carbon with that. And crucially, we have this excellent um, upper Jurassic salt seal. Um, now, additionally, if we look at this neighboring structure here, this undrilled, uh, it's a similar sort of salt cord fold with a faulted overburden above that second layer of salt. Beneath this carb, we can't really image the basement, but here we can see quite clearly beneath this Permian salt, we have a series of tilted fault blocks in the carbon infrasection. Um, and within that carbon infrasection, we know we have nice fluvial sandstone reservoirs. They're a bit tighter than uh, the carb sandstone, but they're not too bad. So we may have both stacked natural gas charges uh, for the present, but it means that when we do eventually begin to store carbon in this area, we have a very large saline aquifer which we to rely on to put this CO2 into it. Now, some of the key risks for working in this area, the main one is that it's a very high cost um, operating environment. Offshore Ireland, anyone who's been to the western coast of Ireland on holiday will know, even at the height of summer, it's going to be very windy. It's going to be a very um, short weather window for operating, usually sort of late April up until sort of September, October. So you have a very narrow window for operations, be they drilling or maintenance. Um, and crucially, at present, there are no carpet capture um, sites installed in Ireland. The nearest one is in the UK. Now, in the future, it's very likely that Ireland will eventually retrofit its gas-fired power plants and cement industry cement plants uh, with carbon capture technology. And when that happens, these will become excellent sites uh, for CO2 storage. But again, that's something that at present is a risk for using these things as uh, storage sites for CO2. Now, to achieve what I'm sort of saying here with regards to the, the CO2 storage, What's, what becomes evident is that there's a really nice synergy between near-term exploration for natural gas in this basin um, and the future storage of CO2. It's one of the best areas in Ireland to store uh, sequestered carbon, and that's something we need to do if we want to achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Accords and keep uh, global warming beneath that crucial 2 degrees C uh, change. So one of the things that's crucial to this is, is having on the operator side an exploration policy that is looks into the future a bit and realizes, okay, in the near term, I'm drilling these things looking for gas. But when I go to develop them, let's install the capacity that they can be relatively easily retrofitted or, or changed to be used as injection technology for CO2. Um, whereas then on the policy side, on the legislator side of things, they need to encourage an exploration framework um, that supports operators that are doing this and, and encourages companies to think about the future while also developing their prospects at present. And at least at ICRAG, we're just a research body, but we engage with our policy partners here in Ireland. They're the uh, Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment, who regulate offshore oil and gas exploration, and then the Geological Survey of Ireland, because they, you know, they deal with the geology of Ireland. So at present, we, we've learned a lot more about salt tectonics offshore Ireland, and we can kind of understand why they play such an important role in the exploration for natural gas and why they make such good structures um, to store it. But also we realize that we have a, a vast wealth of um, potential storage sites for CO2. Um, and that's a good thing because Ireland is becoming more and more climate conscious and they wanna, we want to improve you know, the earth for everybody. So having this wealth of potential uh, storage sites for CO2 is great. Now this isn't exactly the Gallup Innovation Challenge, but it is a challenge to operators to say, you know, we need to be getting, we need to begin to think about long-term exploration strategies and how we can tie that into, you know, a, a carbon neutral and a carbon negative even industry. Um, and I think this is probably the best way to do it if companies switching towards natural gas, as Thor Christensen uh, mentioned in the first day of the Gallup Open Days. Um, if we think long-term and we begin to adapt this mindset into our exploration strategies um, and particularly our development strategies, um, we can end up doing a lot of good uh, for relatively low cost in the near term. So with that, I say muito obrigado. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Connor. Um, I just uh, have one question. Uh, curiosity, really. Uh, I've worked in New Ventures, but uh, I've never actually worked in any of the opportunities that we looked into Ireland. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering um, in the core of gas field, uh, why do we have gas in the Triassic and the oil in the Jurassic? Why don't we have oil as well in the Triassic? Is it different um, source rock? Yes. So I didn't explain it. The main oil-prone source rock 
is in the lower Jurassic. It's it's a plains okay. back in. There's two plains back in and two Arsian shales. Um, mm -hmm. There is evidence that there was. So in some of the cores from Carb, there is sort of a residual bitumen staining. And there are some oil prone source rocks in the lower Carboniferous. Now, at present, they're buried way too deeply. They're, they're completely cooked. Um, mm -hmm. So there would be areas in the basin where you could imagine that you would get where you have the Jurassic above the lower Jurassic due to, you know, large strain faults, where you could move oil into the um, into the into that Triassic reservoir. But it's largely due to that in most parts of the basin, the source rocks or oil are above the Triassic. Essentially, that's the, yeah. the main issue. And then and then the base and then the basin was tectonically inverted, right? When the rift was aborted and and the other basin opened. So okay. Low chance of oil then, or at least yeah, finding anything well, interesting. Yeah. A lot of, if almost every well that has drilled a valid structure has found a very large residual oil column. So if you came <laughs> back and drilled in like at the end of the Jurassic, you'd be very happy. Yeah. But unfortunately, time doesn't stop them. So, um, yeah, there are like there is. So there was that 2741. There is abandoned. There is an oil discovery in the basin. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to look for structures that. Because the the thing that the crucial thing is that a lot of the older wells, when you look at the old seismic, because that poster section is so thin, the offsets on those faults on the seismic data are like 10 to 20 milliseconds. So particularly on the older data when they were drilling those wells, you can't actually see the reactivation of those faults. So it's a very subtle thing, but it's very pervasive. But there are structures undrilled at present that don't have that. So there is the potential for a few other things, uh -huh. but again. The policy switch is the issue, so it's it's the government sort of moving away from oil and focusing on natural gas. But there there might be a few a few oil discoveries waiting to be found. Okay, but um, that's uh, that's what's happening today in the world. So we'll we'll adapt to it. Thank you very much, very Connor. It was a pleasure to have you, and I think uh, that's it from my part too. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being present in this session, everyone. We finish our presentations very interesting on the room tree of the seven Gulf Open Day. Uh, we remind you that tomorrow we will wait for you at 2 p.m. on room one for the debate on energy transition, and uh, the, the the event will continue on room.